Thank you for taking the time to listen to Pastor Eddie's Bible study. Due to the nature of the discussion, he would ask that you would listen to all his answers and responses to each statement and question that has been asked. I got to give you, as we get started tonight, the proverb of the week. I've been doing this the last couple of weeks, and I love this one. You're going to love it. It's out of the book of Proverbs, Wisdom, Literature, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17. Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel not his own. In other words, mind your own biswax. Amen? I was telling Rochelle when I read this, I said, I remembered back in, uh, when I was in seminary and having to work at the University of Kentucky Medical Center as a chaplain, part of the training, that we were in the emergency room one night and there had been a shooting in eastern Kentucky. And so uh, two family squabbles were going on. And I mean, they were hot with each other. I, it, actually, it was a grandson shot his grandpa. Was that, but, he, but he survived. And I, it appeared it was going to get okay. But the two families were were fighting and they were fighting in the emergency room and I got between them. I remember that. I thought that was my job. Steve is there is the chaplain on call that night. And I remember, and I'm sure it was an angel of the Lord bumping me in the head, you know, and said, you idiot, you idiot. You. I was right, seriously, literally between them. And it dawned on me like, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. And then they're going to kill each other. And I finally got out of the way. I thought the police will have to take care of this, you know. So let me read it again. Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel not his own. So again, mind your own business. Somebody say amen. amen. Proverbs 26, verse 17. All righty, well, let's go to the good Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you give to us, for your amazing blessings. And it's always wonderful to see the great turnout on Tuesday nights. And we are delighted to have our scholar with us uh, to, again tonight, Brother Steve. And he's been breaking the bread of life for us. I think our session last week, Lord, at least in my spirit, was one of the uh, my favorites. I just I was so moved and touched, and uh, underlining the the uh, comments that Steve was making. I just thank you again for him and everyone in this room that you've brought us together to learn together, to study together, and we can each do something for the glory of God. Father, I just praise you. Praise you, praise you, praise you. We just ask your blessings tonight, and especially as we do each week for the homeless ministry, for Mike and Susie that have taken the lead on that, and all the different volunteers, many here even tonight, that have taken turns carrying the food out there to those folks. Lord, just bless us, guide us, lead us, direct us as only you can. And may all of God's children say, Brother uh -huh. Steve. Okay. Um, last week, I dealt with several topics, and I have a few of those sheets left. I don't have enough for everybody if you didn't bring it, but if you weren't here last week, I'd like somebody to pass those out to those who weren't here. There's two sheets, so I need a couple of hander outers. Anybody? <laughs> Somebody else? Okay, that's the second sheet. Only to those who didn't bring it. I mean, only those who didn't, weren't here last week, but I don't think there's enough for everybody to hand out. Um, so, Eddie wanted me to kind of summarize this because we went through it in a hurry. So I'm going to summarize it and then let you ask questions, and then we'll jump into our lesson for tonight. <clears throat> Okay, that's all I have. So first come to go to the people who weren't here last week. Um, this might have seemed like a disjointed lesson, but really there was a logic to it. The logic started out in talking about what do you do with people that have personal objections to God's existence because of their own pain and suffering. And, you know, when somebody tells you they're an atheist, I suggested that you should try to probe that a little bit more to find out if they have a personal reason why they've rejected God. And I would say a good way to do that is to acknowledge them as, you know, yes, this is a serious problem. There is, there is uh, you know, ask them, is this because maybe you have some personal pain or suffering in your life that you 
doubt that God exists. And so you can ask them that, and you can also share some of your own personal pain and suffering that you've gone through. And then ask them, you know, is there something in your life, some tragedy or something that would cause you to doubt the existence of God? Um, and then I, I led from that, you know, that's, you know, getting at their own personal needs, personal problems, personal questions and difficulties with the existence of God. And I mentioned the uh, movie, The God is, God is Not Dead, and the atheistic professor there, who was actually played by a Christian, by the way, and he had a personal hurt in his life that led him to reject God, and that was the death of his mother. Of course, that was the storyline of the movie. Um, and then I went from that into talking about answering that objection, the objection that evil is a reason for rejecting the existence of God. And I talked about you know, the fact that if you say that evil is a problem for rejecting the existence of God, you have to look at the fact that you're in effect saying things are not the way they're supposed to be. And if things are not the way they're supposed to be, then you have to have a basis for saying that. The atheist doesn't have a basis for saying that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. So you're going to ask him, what do you mean? You know, what do you mean that things aren't the way they're supposed to be? Because in an atheistic, impersonal world, if there is no God, all we have is material universe. It's impersonal. Things are just the way they are. <laughs> you know, that's, and he has no solution to the problem of evil. You can also say to him, look, the problem of evil is everybody's problem, not just my problem. It's your problem. It's everybody's problem. You don't have a solution to that problem. You just have to say, well, sorry, folks. Tough luck. Tough it out. This miserable life is all you get and there's no resolution to it. So that's not a very compelling situation to be in. So if there is a way that things are supposed to be, and this is really a presuppositional argument, if there is a way that things are supposed to be, what are they supposed to be? And where is that supposed to be come from? Yeah, I think it's, you know, so really you're turning this argument back upon the unbeliever and saying, this is, if you believe that things are not the way they're supposed to be, and there is a way they're supposed to be, this is really an argument for God. Because if we're going to get out of this mess we're in, rescue has to come from outside this world. It's not going to come from in the world. We're not going to stop tornadoes and hurricanes, and we're not going to st stop all evil of human beings and what they do to other human beings. We can't do that. So... That's a presuppositional argument. In other words, you're taking their assumptions and using it against them. And say, your assumptions argue for my view of the world, not your view of the world. So, I think that's a very powerful argument. I like, and I said, the most powerful argument the unbeliever has is the existence of evil. That's his biggest, that's his trump card. That's his ace in the hole. And you can turn that right back on him and say, no. That's a problem that really argues for my view of the world, the Christian view of the world. When I say my view, I say the Christian view of the world. Um, then I talked about why did God make the world that way? And we talked about how God cannot do anything. Remember, God cannot sin, God cannot lie, God cannot be tempted, God can't make a square circle. He can't make a Subway sandwich that he can't eat so big that he can't consume it all. Well, he can't make a world where human beings and angels are truly free moral agents where they don't have the possibility of screwing up. Okay, God can't do that. If they're going to be truly free, truly free, they have the choice whether or not they're going to love God or hate God, you know, they have the possibility of making huge mistakes. And, you know, God could have made a world without free moral agency. He could have made a world just of animals. You know, animals don't disregard God. They don't disobey God. They do what they're supposed to do. As I said, cats do what cats are supposed to do. Dogs do what dogs are supposed to do. Zebras do what zebras are supposed to do. Giraffes do what giraffes are supposed to do. They don't ever war against God. But free moral agents can turn against God. And so when people ask you these, what I would call goofball questions, you know, can God make a Subway sandwich that he can't eat? That is a 
You tell me. What is it? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> category fallacy. Very good. A category fallacy. What do I mean by a category fallacy? Well, eating a Subway sandwich that you can't consume assumes that God has a stomach. You're, you're, you're talking about a category of a being that has a stomach. You know, we can get too full from overeating. I had that experience recently. <laughs> Not a good practice. You know, you can overeat. We can stuff ourselves. God doesn't have a stomach. You know, he doesn't have a stomach. It's a nonsense question. You know, can God create a rock that he can't lift? Well, I mean, God created all this incredibly vast universe, first of all. That we can't even find the end of it yet. But why would God war against himself? That's assuming that God is imperfect and he wants to destroy himself. I mean, that's, you know, so you have the category of a God who's warring against himself. Well, that isn't God. That's a G, little g God. <laughs> the perfect God doesn't war against himself. So that's a category fallacy. And I said that one of the ways, or one of the questions that atheists will always throw at you is, who made God? Well, that's the category of a creature. If you're made, you're a creature, you're created. So to ask that of God, when, who made God? God is uncreated. By definition, he has a seity. He is self-existent and he's self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything. And he doesn't have an origin. Now, I know that we can't wrap our minds around that. I'm not saying that's comp you know, that it's, we can express it. But to really wrap our minds around it, because we've only experienced things that had an origin, you know? I mean, everything that we've experienced in this life had an origin. But God didn't have an origin. He always existed. And that, that is, you know, we, we can't really wrap our minds around it. We can say it, but it's really, really a complex thing. But that's what God is. God is self-existent. By definition. So to say, who created God is a nonsense question. Okay. <clears throat> so, yes. Linda. Okay. I try not to do that. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just don't understand. I was always under the impression that God made us in his image. Mm -hmm. So if he made us in his image, how come we have stomachs? And how come we can, we, you know, we don't get, we get full. And he, he doesn't get full. I don't understand. Okay. Well, if you look at the image of God as the Bible defines it, it's righteousness, knowledge, and true holiness. So that in those ways... We are like God. We have righteousness, knowledge, and true holiness. Now, that's why Christian theologians, there are some Christian theologians that deny that man after the fall is still the image of God. They're a very small minority. I don't hold that position. I believe that man is still the image of God, but he is a very distorted image. Now, does do unbelievers still have a form of righteousness? Yes, they do, because if you ask somebody, about principles of virtue, for example. You know, if you ask an unbeliever, do you think murder is right? Most of them will say no. <laughs> they may commit murder, but even murderers usually say, yeah, murder is but not a good thing. You talk to a thieves, you ask a thief if thievery is good. Well, no, it isn't good, but I do it anyway, they say, you know. So, I mean, people acknowledge virtue. They acknowledge virtue as being a good thing. And they have a knowledge of truth because God has left that. The law of God is written on the human heart. So they have a distorted form of all those realities. And that's why Jesus restores us to being the true images of God. Still imperfect in this life, but we are getting back to what the image of God was meant to be, which is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That is what God created us to be. So... I don't know, did that answer your question? You know, so we're a creaturely image, you know. We are, we are a creaturely image of God. Um, but that isn't true of any of the animals, you know. They just do what they're created to do. But they, aren't not, they are not made in God's image. God does not have a physical body, just we do. That's right. God doesn't have a physical body. But we do have a physical body. But our Savior Jesus has a physical body, which is very 
fast. Yes, yes, he does. He was resurrected, so he has a physical body like we do. Only it's glorified now. I mean, you look at the, uh, you know, the image of Christ in the book of Revelation. He shines like the sun. You know, so when John saw Jesus, he shone like the sun. It was, wow, magnificent. And someday we will be shining like the sun, I believe, as well. Because we're going to be like Christ in our glorified bodies. The, the, those who are in heaven right now are spirits, the book of Hebrews tells us. They are spirits. They've not yet been resurrected. So when our loved ones die, they still exist, but they are spirits, and they're waiting for the day of the resurrection when the spirit and the body will be reunited. Yes, well, Beverly. I happened to watch David Jeremiah, uh, and he said, which wait, I wait, for the wait for the microphone. Uh, I watched J David Jeremiah and I, was going to, I wanted to ask Eddie this question ever since I saw him about I don't know a couple months ago he's doing a um, whole series on what heaven's like what the Bible says about heaven mm -hmm. and he said that when we die we have a temporary body Tem and so I thought to myself well where does it say that in the Bible my first you know, and so he he said that otherwise we would be a something spirit just floating around heaven, and how would we recognize? I don't know. He went into a whole thing about how we're going to have this temporary body, but it's not the one that we're going to get when Christ comes back. And I thought I really like David Jeremiah, so I was just a, a little shocked at his, uh, you know, because then I thought, well, gee, maybe we just what are we just wandering around heaven in a spirit? What are we going to do? It just made a whole load of questions in my mind. So I'm glad to ask you this because they say we recognize people, and I've heard people that have gone and come back, and then they said, oh, their mother and their father, they were greeted, so they saw the person. So what, we're if we're just a spirit, how are we going to see the spirit? Come on, answer That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I, I would say, you know, Hebrews chapter 12, 24 and following talks about the, the spirits of just men made perfect. And it's speaking about those who are in heaven. Um, you know, this, what, what we're going to be like in heaven, you know, the scriptures doesn't go into a lot of detail. It really doesn't. And that heaven is not our final destination. It's the new heavens and the new earth. That's only a temporary place. It's going to be a great place, but it's not our final destination. We look forward to the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to be resurrected, have glorified bodies, and we're going to live in a recreated cosmos. So, you know, the Bible doesn't really talk a lot about heaven. Now, um, you know, if, if I could follow up with what he says, you know, and you look at Luke chapter 16, it does talk about, uh, Lazarus and the man that's in t tradition called Dives and he has a tongue you know so is yeah and they're talking back and forth what does that convey to us I don't know the answer to that I'll be very honest with you but their bodies are in the grave they're not with them so Jesus is speaking in in a way and that is a parable too it's a story so a story doesn't have to necessarily conform completely to reality. But, uh, you know, but anyway, <laughs> that's, you know, that's a difficult question. I will admit that. So, uh, yes. What is meant by uh, new earth? Well, the new earth, the new heavens, the new earth is as I understand it from scripture, a recreated cosmos. The cosmos, the universe that we live in now is dying. It's a dying universe. The stars are dying. You know, everything is dying. I mean, eventually the stars will all be burned out. The second law of thermodynamics, that's why the earth, the universe, when people say that the universe existed forever, my first question is to them, how could that be so? Second law of thermodynamics, everything's running down. Everything is breaking up. The stars are burning up. Eventually, the stars are going to be cold and dead. So apparently, 
you know, and again, I'm speculating because the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but I would say that God is going to make the cosmos so it's not dying because we're going to be immortal. The Bible tells us that. We're going to share in God's immortality. So if we're going to be immortal, we're going to be in a new heavens and a new earth, I would say we're going to be living in a cosmos that is not dying, is not being destroyed. Now, what that's going to be like, I don't know, but this cosmos that God made is pretty beautiful, pretty incredible. So, you know, I mean, God can... God can make something really incredible beyond what we've even experienced here. Yes, Ray. If we're in spirit form, it doesn't matter. Uh, this, this, the matter here on this, this, like you said, in this atmosphere right now is slowly uh, cooling off, burning up, causing back and going back into matter, which is positive matter. He can take the matter we have here and transverse it into into another whole new creation. So mm -hmm. it's nothing big to that. Yeah, God has the ability to do... Whatever he wants. Yeah, whatever he wants is consistent with his character. You know, it's consistent with his character. Um, so God can do everything he wants, but he can't do anything. <laughs> there's, a there's a difference there. Maybe yes. He, you can see the spirit. Maybe spirits can see each other. Yes. You know, some of them, maybe I, just because I, we don't have a body, we still can... Can see, see the image other. of you, and you can see right. the image of me. And I would assume they can, because mm -hmm. angels no doubt see each other. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Um, and they recognized Moses and uh, Elijah when they came back. You know, maybe if they tried to touch Moses and Elijah, they would have went through them like a hologram. But but mm -hmm. they did see them, right? I, well, one one guy, one fellow that I studied, um, not a theologian, but a, actually a biochemist, biophysicist, and he said that we all have, every single one of us, have a frequency, an electrical frequency that is unique to our own body. And he said, if God wants to call you up in the resurrection, all he has to do is call your number, your frequency, and whoosh, you know, whatever you are is going to be assembled the way he wants you to be. I thought that was rather interesting. But we all have a unique number that God has assigned to each one of us. And the frequency of human beings is different than the frequency of animals. Mm -hmm. They have a different frequency. And that's different than the frequency of plants. And each level is more complex, more detailed. I mean, we have a more detailed frequency. I believe it's like five digits long versus four for animals and three for plants or something like that. But I mean, it's, it's, God has made an incredible universe. We live in a mathematical universe. Cool. So, um, I got a question, Steve. If yes. You don't mind. It's on page three, okay. uh, the six, second paragraph, where it says, evil here has the sense of calamity. God does put calamity into the world as a judgment for man's sin to humble us and bring us to our senses. If someone is asking me, you say, if they read that and they'd say, you know, Eddie, you're saying that God put, put the evil in, so he's the creator of evil. How would you answer that, if you don't mind? Well, he's not, he's not the origin. When, God say, when mm -hmm. it says God is not the author of sin, it means that we act as free moral agents. He doesn't okay. push us to do evil. Mm -hmm. But God, as God, has the right to judge angels and men for their sin. And so that aspect is, it's evil, you know, in quotes. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. not, an, it's not a moral evil, okay. but it is not the way it's supposed to be either. Right. You know, it's a bad situation. Mm -hmm. So it is calamity. But the Hebrew uses the word ra there, which is used for moral evil, but it's not used there in the sense of moral evil. It's talking okay. about calamity that happens in a city. Okay. So okay. it gets us into, you know, making those distinctions. But, uh, you know, God has the right to judge us for our, for our wickedness, and he does. Would you also say on the opposite of that, uh, I remember a situation in a previous church where a gentleman said that there were 36 young men at, on this floor at Shands. This was years ago. And all of them had leukemia, and his son was the only one that lived. And I knew his son. He was in my church at the time. And he said he was sharing that one day and just praising God. And he said, it must be a miracle. He said, we prayed, and my son was healed. And one of the men in the uh, prayer group said, well, what happened to my son? You know, we prayed for my son, and he died. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he looked at me, I remember, and he said, he said what do I say? 
you know, and I mean, I just said a whole bunch of junk. I don't know. I don't even know what to say to him, but that is a, you know, the idea of just the opposite of calamity is that, you know, are there those that God just graciously, you know, answers the prayer and brings the wonderful healing touch while others obviously did not receive the healing touch? I mean, that's just life. Yeah, well, that's, you know, I mean, if we look at the world, we have to recognize the sovereignty of God. You know, I mean, God yes. is sovereign in, in a lot of ways that we don't have control over. And don't understand it. And don't understand. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we don't, the day of our death is appointed before the day of our birth. You know, mm-hmm. our lifespan is in God's hands. That's why Stonewall Jackson could say in the midst of battle, hey, I'm as safe here as I am in my bed because exactly. if God wants me to die, I'm going to die. And if he doesn't, I'm not going to die. Right. Yeah. As bullets were whizzing all around him. And George Washington, as I use Same that thing, example, yeah. you know, six bullets through his clothing. He never got, you know, pierced with any of those bullets. Just an amazing story. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, George Washington, just as a side here, George Washington wasn't actually the first president of our country. Did you know that? Because we had presidents under the Articles of Confederation. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't technically the first president of our country. Um, he was the first under the Constitution, but not the first of our country. Um, so then I talked about we shouldn't deny the sovereignty of God when we look at uh, the actions of men, that somehow there is a congruence, a coming together of God's will and human will to accomplish his purpose, and that's mysterious, but that's what the Bible teaches us, that God is involved. He's not up in heaven just watching what happens. He's involved. He's very personally involved in history. Even in the evil actions of men, he has a purpose to fulfill. We see that in the crucifixion of Christ and Joseph's brothers selling him into slavery. And then I got down to the last paragraph, and I kind of want to read through the last paragraph again because that, I kind of had to quickly run through it. But this is really important because people will ask, you know, when all is said and done, you know, after we go through all this trouble and trial and misery of this world, don't we just get back to what we had in the Garden of Eden? And the answer to that is no. Because Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were mortal. They had to continue to eat of the tree of life in order to sustain life. And evidently, Eve, if, if there had not been a fall, Eve would have had pain in childbearing. So there must have been pain. So, I mean, God says, you know, after the fall, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and conception. So it's, there's a multiplication of that sorrow and conception. So man in the garden was mortal, but he had a way of rejuvenating himself by eating the tree of life. That's my understanding of that. But we don't go back to that situation. We go far beyond that. So let me just read the last paragraph. Evidently to our Lord, a world of where creatures had the option to choose to love him was a better and more valuable world than a world of robots, or you say animals, that was free of pain and suffering. Will it be worth it? The Bible teaches us that God alone is immortal, 1 Timothy 6.16. Romans 2, 5 through 11 teaches us that immortality is a gift, it should be, that God gives to those who seek it. We have the privilege as believers to be partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. Now, I understand to mean that we, we, human beings, are given immortality to live as God lives forever. Immortality means deathlessness. So God shares with us his attribute of immortality but only through the process of refinement so that we are thankful for such a tremendous gift. God is molding our character through the trials of life, Romans 5, 3 through 5. People that just get everything handed to them on a silver platter are usually folks who think they are entitled. They take everything for granted. When people arrive at a goal through trial and difficulty, the end result is so much more appreciated. Note, I am not saying that we earn or merit the tremendous gift of immortality, but we appreciate it so much more because it wasn't just handed to us either. Our actions play a role in all of this. I list some references there. Ever keep in mind that God rewards obedience, including the obedience of faith, but that reward is gratuitous, that is a free gift, like you give a uh, gratuity to a waiter or a waitress, and not meritorious, that is something we have earned or deserved. So, we're not going to just get back to the Garden of Eden. We're going to go far beyond the Garden of Eden and have 
God's attribute of immortality. And that's pretty awesome. And Romans 2 talks about those who seek for immortality and life. So definitely want it. It's a great gift. Any other questions on this? That's a good question, and I'll give you my answer to that. Eddie would not be happy if we didn't have fried chicken in heaven. <laughs> I believe the scriptures indicates, yes, we will eat in heaven. It talks about, you know, <laughs> we're going to have the pleasure of eating. But I'll be, how can I say this? We will not be going to the bathroom. We will, you know, we will not be going to the bathroom because that's part of a fallen creation. You know, we're like the animals in that regard. We go to the bathroom because we have an imperfect body that doesn't process food very well. That's just to be blunt. Yes, way back in the back. Yeah, to kind of change the subject a little bit, are you going to be dealing with talking with agnostics? Because that's going to differ, differ a little bit from... I have two friends that are agnostics. One of them actually yes. asked me today to pray for her. So just want to know how to <laughs> talk to them. An agnostic to me is a timid atheist. Um, because, <laughs> like I said before, you can ask them, if you're really an agnostic, do you hedge your bets? In other words, if there is God, do you come and worship him? Do you try to live for him? Do you, you know, I mean... Do you really hedge your bets if you think there is possibly a God? And do you try to figure out who that God might possibly be? I think an atheist is just, or an agnostic, I should say, is just kind of someone that didn't want to go all the way and say, well, I can't really know that there is, I can't really say honestly that there is no God out there anywhere because you haven't explored all the universe and you certainly haven't explored, you know, that which is outside this dimension of life outside of space, time, and dimension. You haven't explored that. How do you know it doesn't exist? So they're trying to be somewhat more cautious and say, well, I'm an agnostic. But it still gets them into the same problems that an atheist has. So the answers I'm going to give you will fit for them too. It really will. Because their situation gives them no answers to all the problems that we're going to be discussing. One of which we're going to discuss tonight. And that's the moral problem. So we're going, to go on, we're going to go on with the subject of the moral difficulties that the unbeliever has. I need somebody to pass out some sheets. Just one to everybody. You can split that. I'll save this one. We may, not, we may or may not get to this. Steve, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Oh, that the uh, human DNA is getting weaker and weaker. And my thought was, um, is that why we have so much technology today? Just to assist us, because we can't figure out math on our own. We can't build stuff on our own. We can't do things that we used to do on our own. We need assistance. Do you think that has anything to do with um, the DNA well, going down? The fact that Just our DNA is getting more and more mutated which that's, that's genetic entropy. In other words, there's a downward spiral of the human race. The reason our lifespans have increased a little bit in recent times is because we have a technological revolution that allows us to drive cars so we don't have to walk everywhere. Uh, it allows us to have central heating and central air conditioning, which is, you know, our ancestors, you know, when they build a fire, the further you get away from the fire, the colder it is, right? The closer you get gets too hot. I mean, we have a miracle, really, of having central air, central. I mean, we can control the temperature down to the exact degree. It makes a big difference. We have a good distribution of food. Now, that's not true of all the people in this world. We're very blessed in this country to have these. I mean, we should count ourselves as very, very wealthy people because we really are. By, I mean, kings hundreds of years ago would trade places with us any day of the week. They lived in cold, drafty castles, you know. 
I mean, we have a tremendous, tremendously blessed world that we live in. We're very, very wealthy by biblical standards. Every single one of us, even including the poor. So, but there is, and I was just hearing a guy talk about this the other day, genetic entropy, geneticists are realizing we've got to learn somehow to correct these mutations in the genes because it's getting bad. It's getting bad very rapidly. You know, our genetic downgrading is, is proceeding at a rapid pace. So, you know, it's, it's a serious problem. And of course, that is an argument, I would say, for a young universe. Because if, we're, if the human race is millions and millions of years old, well, we, we, we degraded very slowly <laughs> under that scenario. And uh, that's why that Nathaniel Jensen that I read about a time or two ago, he says, no, it argues the genetic DNA that we have argues for a very young universe, that mankind has not been around that long. I thought that was rather interesting. Okay. Um, I think everyone has this now. We're going to continue with this same topic. And I'm going to continue. Remember, I handed out a sheet a while back. said there's three different approaches to apologetics. There's the approach of evidences. And I gave you guys that tend to use that, although they sometimes dip over in the other areas. But uh, an example of that would be uh, Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, one of his famous books. Well, he focused on evidences that argue for Christianity. And evidences do argue for Christianity. But the problem is we have an unbelieving world that filters everything through their grid. They don't look at facts the way we do. So just to say, well, let me share with you the facts, doesn't mean they're going to say, oh, yeah, I see those facts. They're going to say, I don't see those facts the way you do. Um, I saw a beautiful example of that. I was going to bring that along tonight, and I somehow forgot it. But I was going to read you a little bit about a hummingbird. Hummingbirds are amazing creatures. They flap their wings 50 to 80 times a second. And if they really want to zip or, you know, stay motionless, they can flap it up to almost 200 times a second. And they have their wings. I mean, most birds go like this. Hummingbirds have a, have a, have a uh, what do I want to say, figure eight. Figure eight. That was figure eight way of flat. I mean, it's a miracle. And this article was saying that if they didn't have the God design that they do, they would literally burst into flames. You know how when you're working really hard, you get very hot? Well, can you imagine how hard these little birds are working? Why don't they burst into flames? Well, because they're breathing 250 times a second and their heart's beating around 600 to 1,200 beats per minute. You know, I mean, they're really pumping it out. So, I mean, they're, they're miraculous birds. And you look at that and we say, this is obvious that God made this. But an evolutionist looks at it and he says, no, it happened over billions of years, millions of years, and happened by chance, by accident. So we're looking at the same fact, the hummingbird, he comes to one conclusion, we come to another conclusion. So facts in and of themselves don't speak for themselves. So we want to look at the assumptions that everybody comes to when they're looking at the world. Everybody has assumptions. Those are called presuppositions. And we want to show the unbeliever that his presuppositions get him into problems. So let's jump into this. Again, I'll read this not to bore you, but so that you have it in front of you and you can reread it and look at it and take notes. And you don't have to furiously take notes. In his book, The God Delusion, on page 31, Richard Dawkins, who is a retired Oxford professor, now this is on page one. I did paginate this time, so it's on page one. Page one. I got smart, finally. Uh, he's a retired Oxford professor and probably the most famous contemporary atheist writes. And here's his quote. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Notice he says fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Woo! <laughs> he doesn't like our God. 
Doesn't like him at all. Okay. How should we respond to this vicious attack on our Lord? Trying to slog through all this verbiage designed to make us despise the God of Scripture and try to respond in a defensive manner would bog down very quickly in argument. So, I mean, if you try to go through all these words and say, well, let's talk about this word. You get in a 10-minute to 30-minute discussion about one word, you know, and then you go on to the next one. You're, gonna, you're not going to work through all those words. So, you've got to go on the offensive. Not being offensive, but go on the offensive. Um... It would get us nowhere fast with responses and counter-objections. It would be better to cut this Gordian knot in one fell blow by putting Dawkins and his followers on the spot by asking some simple questions. Now, you're all familiar with the Gordian knot. Maybe you're not. But the Gordian knot, supposedly, according to legend, there was this knot in Phrygia of the ancient world, and it was a massive knot composed of many knots that were all tied together, and the legend was that whoever could separate that knot would conquer Asia. And Alexander the Great, a lot of people tried to separate that knot and they couldn't get it separated. Alexander the Great came in there, he looked at it, and he tried to work out a little bit, and he finally just whoosh, he whips out his sword and goes whoosh, right down through the knot. It separated. Guess what? He conquered Asia. So that's the Gordian knot. You just, you're going to have to take the thing out. You'd rather than try to untie each one of these little knots that Mr. Dawkins has given to us, we've got to pull out the sword like Alexander did, according to legend, whip right through that thing, cut it in two. So you have to challenge his presuppositions, his assumptions about reality or her assumptions about reality. We have to cut the atheist and his arrogance off at the knees, philosophically speaking, not literally. I'm not advocating chopping anybody off at the knees. The heart of these accusations against God touches upon the subject of ethics. See, that's what we're dealing with, ethics, what's right and what's wrong. The gist of all these various charges is that the God of the Bible is evil and immoral. To answer this and similar kinds of remarks, we must go on the offensive and challenge the atheist's claim even to have a credible ethical system. See, he doesn't have an ethical system that makes sense. Remember what I said? The unbelievers are philosophical kleptomaniacs. They steal from our world and life view over and over and over again. So you've got to say, you don't have a basis for your ethical system. Well, you would put that in the form of a question. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Going on then. If an atheist has no ethical system that makes any sense, all his charges against God become groundless and fall in a heap of absurdity. So here is how I would respond to the atheist who makes these or similar charges. Quote, I see you believe the God of the Bible is a terrible moral example. I would be happy to discuss these accusations with you. But, you know, see, if you'll come in my sphere of thinking, I'll be glad to talk about these things, you know. But first, I have to understand something. What is your basis for determining right and wrong? In other words... How do you make ethical decisions? Or better yet, how should anyone determine proper ethical behavior? See, you're asking him, now he's on the defensive. He has to answer. And see, a lot of Christians get themselves into trouble because they give ground to the unbeliever. They basically concede ground to the unbeliever, and then they try to argue with him. So if I try to go through all these things, and make him say, yeah, your God is just. I see that he's just. <laughs> We're going to be at a long discussion because he comes to it with one set of ideas and I come to it with another set of ideas. And trying to get him to understand the biblical view of things is going to be miserable. <laughs> he's, not, he's not buying it. So you've got to challenge him and say, okay, tell me, what is your basis for deciding right from wrong? Put up or shut up, basically. Okay, going on then. The atheist must find his standard of ethics from within the creation itself because he has no outside divine standard by which to judge right from wrong. So he's got to find something in this world that is the basis for his ethics, for making the decisions as to what is right or wrong. This is the same problem that besets all forms of autonomous self-law ethics. Now, what do I mean by that? I want to explain that. Because somebody doesn't necessarily have to be an atheist to 
assume that ethical decisions should be made based on our reason, that we should reason it out and figure it out ourselves. There's a lot of people that get you know, caught up in that. We're in our Sunday night studies. We're talking about various ethical problems. You know, How do we deal? How does the Methodist Church respond to that? Well, my answer to all these things is we've got to look at Scripture because God gives us a direction in Scripture how we should resolve these things. If we try to reason this through on our own, whether we're atheist or non-atheist, we might even be a Christian. There's Christians that try to figure out ethical problems without looking in God's revelation. And that's autonomous, which means self-law. We figure this out on our own. We, we generate law out of ourselves, And that's really what Satan urged Adam and Eve to do in the garden. You shall be as God, knowing, that is, determining good and evil. You get to determine good and evil for yourself. That's autonomous ethics. We don't want that. So God gives us a standard by which we can determine right and wrong. Okay, so let's go on then. So what I'm saying is you don't have to necessarily be an atheist to espouse autonomous ethics. If God isn't the standard, then man has to be the standard of right and wrong because an impersonal universe cannot provide this kind of evaluation for us. Inanimate objects such as rocks, trees, dirt, the sun, moon, and stars, astrology, you know, people believe astrology affects us, cannot give us ethical guidance. You know, so the impersonal universe cannot give us ethical guidance. You can't look at dirt and rocks and, and figure out what you're supposed to do. The animal kingdom. Some people actually appeal to the animal kingdom. We get direct direction from the animal kingdom. Eh, no. Does the animal kingdom provide us with any help? If we try to obtain guidance from the animal world, we will get a maze of conflicting answers. For example, should we go to the sloth or to the ant to determine what level of activity would be appropriate behavior? I kind of like the sloth, actually. but yeah. no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, you know, I mean, what do we look at? I mean, there's, you look at nature. How are you going to figure this out? Should we determine our consumptive habits, gluttony, by watching a bear who consumes 20,000 20, calories per day? I hope not. You know? Should we copy the black widow spider that consumes its male counterpart after mating? <laughs> Women, don't do that. Please, 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 please don't do that. So, I've already instructed my wife, don't become the black widow. No. <laughs> That's why they're called black widows, by the way. They literally do eat their mate, kill them and eat them. Not a good idea. Should we be polyamorous like dogs? Now, you might say, polyamorous, what's that? Poly means many and amorous means loves. And believe me, there are people today that are advocating for polyamory. That we can have families of three, families of four, you can go outside your husband and wife and have adulterous affairs. You can love multiple people. Believe me, there are people advocating for that and the justice and righteousness of it. So, but should we be polyamorous like dogs or should we be monogamous like some animal species? There are animal species that are monogamous. The Bible does appeal to the animal world for examples of commended behavior. For example, go to the ant, thou sluggard, in Proverbs 6.6, 6, as well as reprehensible behavior. A dog returns to its own vomit in 2 Peter 2.22. I'm sorry for you folks that have dogs, but <laughs> my daughter and son-in-law have dogs, and they admit that they have smelly breath because they eat things they shouldn't be eating, right. including their poo. It's, it's a reality. Now, I love dogs, don't get me wrong, but, you know, they do have some disgusting habits, okay? All right, so it tells us in the Bible that, yeah, animals are given to us as commended behavior and reprehensible behavior, but, this is a big important but, it does so with a backdrop of ethical principles laid out to aid us in this judgment call. So we don't just go to the animal world and say, oh, well, let's see, let's pick and choose here. There's people that argue from the animal world that some animals are homosexual. I don't know if that's true or not, but again, you know, we don't go to the animal world to justify or to condone or to condemn human behavior. The animal world is not the source of ethics. Okay. In other words, ethics is not left up to us to decide based on what we like or don't like in nature. What is appropriate for animals, 
see dogs eating their vomit, they do that for a reason. You know, that's part of their nourishment. So they have a reason for doing it. They're probably not getting the nourishment they need from the food they're eating, but they do that. That's appropriate for them. That's not, we look at that and say, ew, that's gross, but that's the way God made them. It's appropriate for animals because God made them that way. Uh, it may or may not be appropriate for those who are made in God's image. We are not animals. Okay, turn the page, page two. Okay, science. Well, can science give us ethics? You know, people think science is the answer to all of our problems. Science cannot help us here. Morality cannot be determined by weighing, measuring, or doing experiments to see what happens. In fact, science itself depends upon ethics. What would be the value of science if a scientist was free to falsify the results of his experiments to prove his hypotheses? <laughs> he said, oh, I got, I got the results of these experiments I've been doing, but he lies about it. Believe me, that does happen, by the way. Scientists are not always honest. Um, science can only function in an ethical context, context or it will devolve into uselessness. So, I mean, you've got to have ethics to do science. If you don't have ethics, your science is going to be useless because people could lie about their results and what they do to promote themselves. And scientists being sinners sometimes do that. We won't get into that, but... I'm just telling you, science isn't the answer. Can't give you an, it can't give you an ought from an is. Science cannot tell us that we should be honest. No, it doesn't tell us. I mean, you can't measure something and say, oh, I think I should be honest. No, science doesn't tell you that. Science can't tell us we should be honest, but science itself would be, imp would be impossible without honesty. Okay, the next paragraph. To have any credible system of ethics, a moral judgment must have an objective basis. Okay, there has to be an objective basis. To say that something is objectively good or evil requires that the judgment be independent of what people think, believe, or agree upon concerning the matter. So, it's got to be universal. It's got to be true everywhere, you know. Wherever you go, it should be wrong to commit murder. Whether you're in India, Africa, the United States, South America, wherever you go. It's got to have an objective basis. And believe me, people have all kinds of views on ethical problems. You know, where are we going to resolve that? Um, so, to say that something, going back to that, to say that something is objectively good or evil requires that the judgment be independent of what people think, believe, or agree upon concerning the matter. A subjective ethical standard would depend upon what one or several people think, believe, or agree upon. If it is subjective, then it is a preference like a person's love of ice cream over broccoli. I mean, really. If all we have is your opinion and my opinion about what's right or wrong, hey, I mean, Hitler said killing Jews was a good thing. Is it? He said it was. They were a detriment to the human race, according to Adolf Hitler. So, is it just a preference? Is that our ethics just a preference? You know, that was the defense of the Nazis at Nuremberg. Hey, we're just doing our duty. We just did what we were told to do. You can't condemn us. You can't punish us. We're just doing what orders. This is what our culture said to do. You know, what if you're in Borneo somewhere and some guys surround you and they have little rings in their nose and they take you back to your camp and you say, well, I think society should decide ethics. And you take you back to the camp and they have this pot boiling there and you don't see any, uh, any meat source anywhere. Are you going to say, okay, I believe society determines ethics. I'm ready. You can take me. No, I don't think so. Um, ethics, well, if, if it's only a preference, it's only a human preference, we're in serious trouble. Why should my subjective moral values be imposed upon anyone else or vice versa? I mean, ask the unbeliever that. If your moral values are just subjective, why are you imposing it on me? And why should I impose my moral values on you? We get to do whatever we want, right? At this point, the atheist may be getting rather hot under the collar and say, Hey, are you saying I'm not a moral person? I've had them say that. Are you okay? Are you saying I'm not a moral person? <laughs> you should answer, no, 
you are a moral person because you are inconsistent with your world and life view. What I'm asking you to answer is, on what basis can people be good without God? You see, ethics deals not with how we do act, but how we should act. See, who's going to say, if you just have this universe and there's no God out there, how can you say to somebody, this is the way you should act? How can you say that? This is the way you should act. Says who? Says who? (laughs) I mean, what if 50 people say to me, this is the way you should act? If they're telling me to do something that's contrary to God's will, can I stand in the face of them and say, no? Absolutely. So, we can't get from, again, an is to an ought. The unbeliever has no, uh, the atheist has no way of getting there. He's up a creek without a paddle. He has no ethical system that makes any sense whatsoever. That's very important. Underline that sentence. <laughs> Ethics deals not with how we do act, but how we should act. Very important. How can you obtain a should merely from what is? On your assumptions about the nature, I'm talking to the atheist here, on your assumptions about the nature of the universe that we have to determine right from wrong from inside this world, how do we get from an is to an ought? That's my challenge to the atheist. See, you're just asking questions. How do you get from an is to an ought? How do you get to a should we should do something? I mean, he's, now here, here again, this is where he's going to borrow from our view, world and life view. He's going to say that people should do certain behaviors. They should be good to the environment, for example. They shouldn't tr- throw trash out the window. I would agree with that. You know, they should be good to the environment. We should take care of the environment. We should be kind to our neighbor. I mean, he's going he's to throw all these ethical oughts and shoulds on you. You just have to say, hey, that works with my worldview. doesn't work with your worldview. you got a problem. You're building castles in the sky that have no foundation. See what we're doing here? We're challenging him. Okay, going on. Secular ethical claims cannot explain why moral assertions are obligatory. In other words, that we have to do them. They, they're, you know, I mean, if you said to Hitler, you're not supposed to murder. he say, no, 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 no. Jews are bad. We've got to get rid of them. Well, how do you answer that from his world life view? You can't assert from a secular ethical world that there's anything that's obligatory. That's just, it's, just, it's just a personal preference. That's all, it, that's all it is. If a person says that he as an individual is a source of ethical standards, then there can be no ethics. Think about that for a moment. If he says, well, I'm the source of ethics. Well, what does that lead to? Whatever he does is right. And thus the concept of wrong doesn't even exist. I mean, if you're the source of ethics, you can't possibly do anything wrong. Does God do anything wrong? He's the source of ethics. No. He always does right because he's God. If I'm the source of ethics, there's no such thing as wrong because anything I do is automatically right. Well, how do you, you know, you can't multiply that by adding a bunch of people and say, okay, we're going to take about 10 people and get it up here. All we decide to do, that's going to be right. Well, then we don't do anything wrong. (laughs) We've just thrown out the concept of wrong. It doesn't even exist. Does that make sense? Okay. If I am the standard of ethics, I can't do anything wrong because I am the standard. I have to, everything I do is automatically right. We've got some business meetings tonight, so we'll have to pick up from here. (laughs) All right. Let me just mention, and then you can do a closing. Um, With that concept, then, the atheist becomes God, correct? Yes. In other words, I'm God, then, because everything I do is right. And he can't live with that. Yes. He can't live with that. Yes, I see. I'm so over time. I apologize. So, no, no, it's exciting. So, bring these back next week. We're not quite done with this, and I'll give you the next half of this. We're not done with this ethical discussion yet. So, <laughs> we got more questions to ask the atheists. I mean, this is just one. You're you're gonna have this guy. Like I said, when I got together with my friend back when I lived in Colorado, and he thought he was going to discombobulate my belief system about God. By the time we were done, by the time I'd thrown at him about a zillion questions, he, he was so befuddled, he didn't know what to do. <laughs> he was so frustrated. He and his two friends left, and they never wanted to get together again after that. So, 
You can throw questions at them and they don't have answers. Believe me, they do not have answers. You can make them look like fools, which is what you're doing, but you're doing it nicely. You're just asking them questions. The Bible tells us the fool has said in his heart there is no God, and that's true. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us a solid source of understanding in the scriptures. We thank you, Lord, that we can rest our very lives upon the truth of your word, that we have a meaningful revelation from you as our divine creator that gives us guidance and understanding so that we can come to this world and have a proper understanding. Indeed, the Christian faith is the only faith that makes sense of the world around us. May we believe that and may we live it in our lives. Forgive us of our many sins and help us to live for you, O Lord. We look forward to the time when we will share in your immortality to live forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth. Amen.